Hi, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for being here today for our second Human Rights in Practice event, Digital Rights and Discrimination, sponsored by the Duke International Human Rights Clinic and the Center for International and Comparative Law. Today's event is also part of Duke Law's International Week, an annual celebration of international students and scholars here at Duke Law. And before turning the floor over to our two speakers, I'd like to thank our additional co-sponsors for today's event, including the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute and the Duke Human Rights Center at the Keenan Institute for Ethics. Our event today is also co-sponsored by a range of student groups, including the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association, Black Law Students Association, Human Rights Law Society, International Law Society, Latin American Law Students Association, the Middle East and North African Law Students Association, South Asian Law Student Association, and the Women of Color Collective. So thank you all to our many co student co-sponsor groups for today. I will now turn it over to our two speakers. And first we'll hear from Maya Wang, China Senior Researcher in the Asia Division at Human Rights Watch, who will be joining us through audio. And following that, we hear from Nanjola Nyabola, an advocate and independent consultant based in Nairobi, Kenya, and the author of the recently published book, Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Kenya. And Angela will draw heavily from her book in her presentation today. After we hear from them, we'll open it up to Q&A. So please do share any questions you might have via the Q&A feature. And I will read out the questions to our two speakers. So with that, I hand it over to Maya. Thank you. Thank you, Aya. Um, I'm very happy to have the chance to um, join you via audio today. I'm going to talk about um, the use of mass surveillance in um, China, particularly in Xinjiang, um, a part of in northern and um, northwestern China uh, with a minority Muslim population. Um, as you know, uh, probably know, um, the Chinese government practices um, pervasive um, mass surveillance both online and offline. Um, but what we have documented at Human Rights Watch in the last two, three years is the use of um, mass data collection um, throughout the country, um, particularly um, the collection of biometrics and also personal information. The way, the way it works is that the Chinese government, well, first of all, institutes this um, national ID program, which you know, to many of you would sound fairly um, common. Many countries have national ID programs. Um, but um, the Chinese government also collects um, biometrics, um, including um, uh, people's high resolution facial images, but also voices. Um, so there's a voice recognition database. They also collect people's DNA samples, gates, um, and iris scans. And this kind of collection is mass. It's not just about collecting people who have a criminal record or even have been suspected of a crime, but it's of general population. In Xinjiang, this Muslim population, the authorities collect um, these biometrics of people between the age of 12 and 65, and there's no consent. Everyone has to submit this data. In addition to these kind of biometric data, the authorities are also um, essentially collecting people's information concerning their um, movements, um, their, uh, the identifying information of their cell phones when they move about um, in um, Xinjiang. Um, they also know a lot of information about you know, women's reproductive status. Do they have an intrauterine device inserted? That is also collected by police. All of the information is, um, some of that information is collected into and channeled into a big data program, which Human Rights Watch documented uh, last year, um, a big data program called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform, IJOP. And the IJOP is kind of like the mother of these kind of mass surveillance systems. It, it um, collects information from checkpoints throughout the region of Xinjiang. Um, it's collect information from the surveillance cameras, which are equipped with facial recognition and other kind of object recognition capabilities. It is also connected to the access control systems throughout the region. Say, when you go to gas stations in Xinjiang, um, the, um, at the entrance, the gas stations collect people's ID number and also uh, the number plates of the car um, and, and also their faces when they enter the gas station. And the IJOP is also connected to the uh, phone app that is installed 
on official um, phones. And that phone app is used to collect more information about people, but also as a kind of an action platform. So how the IJOP works is that it detects irregularities of people's behavior in the region. So um, the Chinese government considers this whole region of people, of, you know, about 12, um, 21 million people, 12 of which are um, Turkic Muslims. They consider the 12 million Turkic Muslims essentially all of them terrorists. Um, and any irregularities in behavior, such as using too much electricity, using a virtual private network, a VPN, um, to encrypt your internet data, um, uh, driving a car that doesn't belong to you, all of these behavior as potentially um, threatening to the authorities. So any kind of the IGOP is programmed to detect this irregular behavior um, that would generate automatically an alert to alert the authorities, officials are then sent to someone who used too much electricity, who drove a brother's car, who uses WhatsApp, who uses VPN, and then further interrogate them. We have documented that some of these people who are, in, who are flagged by a big data program, interrogated by the police, have ended up in political education camps. These are illegal and lawful facilities in Xinjiang where Muslims are forced to essentially convert to become um, atheists that are loyal to the Chinese Communist Party for an indefinite period of time uh, during which they have um, no access to lawyer, no trial, no, not really a crime whatsoever. Um, and they essentially disappeared um, and subjected to mistreatment and torture. Um, so what I've described in, um, in Xinjiang is not, um, is an extreme example or a more kind of visible example of how mass surveillance works throughout the country. In throughout the country, the Chinese government are building these mass surveillance systems based on tracking people's physical attributes and biometrics that are then um, used for the purpose of um, detecting what the authorities consider to be irregular behavior and used for targeting certain groups of people that they consider problematic, not only Muslims, but people with psychosocial disabilities dissidents, activists, people who complain about the government. Um, and, uh, and all of these also, um, have, they, they have been developed in the last 20 years with the help initially with foreign technology and foreign research. Um, and that kind of exchange of information still goes on. So for example, at universities, we have documented how some universities have research projects with problematic Chinese um, government entities or Chinese companies that have been shown to be um, highly, heavily involved in human rights abuses in Xinjiang and throughout China. So I will just um, stop there. And um, if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to ask. Thanks very much, Maya. And I'll turn it over now to Nanjala Nyabola. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to do two things in my presentation. One is to give a broader um, sort of contextual conversation about the concept of rights, the concept of digital rights, because I think it's really important to have that grounding um, and an understanding about how broad this conversation is. Um, when I started doing research, uh, that the research that became this book, it was about uh, 10, 11 years ago in 2009. And I remember when I proposed the research program as part of my master's thesis, um, my supervisor said, you know, those are middle class concerns. Those, that's not quote unquote, the real Africa. And I say that just to give you a sense of how fast the, the conversation has evolved over the last few years. Um, and here in, in Africa, the number of people who are starting to engage with digital rights, the digital rights conversation is increasing exponentially. Um, but you know, of course, the question is, is it increasing fast enough? Are we keeping pace with the developments? Are we keeping pace with the threats? Are we keeping pace with the opportunities? And it's always a push and pull, but I would argue that there's always need for more people to be engaging in these conversations. There's always need for more people to be thinking creatively about the rights um, conversation more broadly. And for me personally, as a person who has a, a background in human rights, was a background in humanitarian law as well, I think it's the more people we have um, engaging with these conversations, even not necessarily as a digital rights person, but thinking broadly about rights and, and how they intersect with the digital space, um, the better it is for all of us. Um, and I, I, I think it's just really important to establish from the else the digital rights are human rights, because we've had this assumption for a long time that this is a, a niche conversation that techies can engage with, but the, or should be engaging with. But, you know, just 
jumping off of what Maya has just said, what we're seeing is the intersection between technology and power dynamics and social dynamics and structural um, issues is emerging, is, is fueling this rapid uh, contraction in human rights more broadly. It's the digital is, is an intensifier. Whatever it finds, whatever contours it finds in the society that tech is rolled out in, it's going to intensify. So if there are positive um, things that people are reaching out, whether they're organizing, you know, Black Lives Matter, Roads Must Fall, um, you know, uh, uh, we Me Too conversations, those conversations will be intensified, but so too will the processes of surveillance, so too will the processes of um, restricting freedom of expression restricting freedom of association, all of those things. So tech is an intensifier and it's important to, to um, understand that it's not going to fundamentally change the dynamics of a society in question unless there is a deliberate effort, both by activism, advocacy and political interests to address those particular um, characteristics that were already in the society in question. Um, my research focuses on Kenya, and it's not just because I'm a Kenyan, it's because Kenya has been a, 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 an interesting example, a kind of an outlier in the developing, in the world in general, in terms of tech uptake, internet uptake, the use of tech in public life, the use of tech in the public sphere. So the obvious statistics, um, internet penetration, uh, we have the one of the, some of the highest internet penetration in the developing world, I think at the last metric it was at 92%. Most of the people who are connecting in Kenya are connecting through their mobile phones. Um, only at the last count, I think only about 15% of Kenyans were using their computers to connect to the internet. The vast majority of Kenyan's population is below the age of 30. So 60% of the country's population is below the age of 30. And the most people who are uh, using the internet therefore are below the age of, most people who use the internet in Kenya are below the age of 30, but also really um, 18. Um, and the, the, biggest sort of statistic that everybody's familiar with if you go to international publications you'll see people talking about kenya and mobile money um the use of mobile money um bangladesh today bangladesh has more mobile money accounts because bangladesh has a larger population than kenya but as a percentage of the population kenya has the by far the largest uh, mobile money market in the world. Most people who are accessing financial services in the country, whether that's borrowing money or sending money, receiving money, um, are doing it through their mobile phones, through mobile money. And um, the government, this uh, last two administrations have made the internet a pillar of their social political agenda. So in fact, this last government had um, internet, increasing internet access, increasing internet use, increasing um, the use of the internet in the government in their manifesto. So it is an overt part of the public sphere in Kenya. It's a deliberate political action to make the internet, to make the digital part of our um, governance systems. Um, what that means in practical terms is that there is a uh, massive uh, public expenditure on both hardware and software of internet. And there's massive public push to encourage people to use the internet. But at the same time, there is a very little critical reflection on what that actually will mean in the political context. And I'm going to go into some depth about this with the examples that I give. Um, the main point that I want to make at this point, at this stage is that the uptake of the internet in Kenya is not accidental. It's not coincidental. It was a, it was in, intimately connected to the 2007-2008 post-election violence. The infrastructure was already in place, but the accelerated uptake was as a result of the social political dynamics that were triggered and influenced that particular um, out outgrowth of violence, uh, um, outbreak of violence. So just by one example, mobile money. The uptick of mobile money is connected to the dual system that Kenyans have, whereby most of us live in and work in urban areas, but have family, extended family networks in rural areas. And with the outbreak of violence, it meant that people couldn't physically go to those rural areas to take money, um, which usually happens over Christmas breaks, long vacations. People will go and give money to grandparents, give money to cousins, extended family. And because of that violence happening between December 27th and January 10th, that's the worst of the violence, people were not able there was a, a lockdown. People couldn't leave the cities, couldn't leave urban areas and go back to the rural areas. And that meant that mobile money became the main way to maintain those um, social links. Same thing after the post-election violence, um, one of the, the uh, 
commissions that was instituted in order to address that election violence, the Krigler Commission found, said that the problem with electoral politics in Kenya is trust. And the easiest way to address the trust deficit is to use computers, is to use technology in the administration of elections in order to engender trust. So it wasn't an accident. It was something that was supposed to be rolled out between 2007 and the last election, 2017, which was the first fully digital election in the country. Um, and there was deliberate measures to do that as part of the reconciliation process. So some of the rights that emerge in Kenya's space are you know, it's, we, we speak very um, easily about the political rights. Um, Maya has touched on discrimination um, and, and identity rights. So um, in Kenya, the government does, we have a national, we are one of those countries that has a national ID pro, uh, system. But the national ID system in Kenya has always been founded on discriminatory principles. It is grounded in the colonial era. Um, our first ID card system was built from the native registration ordinance, which was a 1915 law that allowed the colonial government, that compelled all men um, over the age of 16 to wear around their necks a pass that had their biometric details, so fingerprints, your father's name, your grandfather's name, what, what uh, village you're from, and you had to wear that around your neck if you were a man over the age of 16. And any white person who found you, especially in an urban area, um, but really moving outside what were called the reserves, which is what the colonial designated homelands um, for different black communities in the country. If you were found to be outside your homeland without a pass, you could be arrested, you could be detained, you could be um, subjected to forced labor. So the native registration ordinance formalized not only racism and, and racist um, uh, sort of citizen tears, but also formalized the violence and allowed this, created this, the, the prisoners, people who are in violation of the past laws, to become this reservoir of forced labor for the, for the colonial state. That logic has never been questioned. The, the ID system has gone through multiple iterations since 1915, since that 1915 law. But for example, the, the ID cards that we carry today, they'll have your thumbprint on it, maybe not all of uh, the 10 fingers, but you know, the other fingers are in the database. Um, it'll have your thumbprint. As a woman, um, um, especially, your ID cannot, or anybody really, but your ID cannot be inherited from your mother. It has to be inherited from your father so that they can build this genealogy that goes back to your pre-independence imagined or whatever family structure. Um, and there's specifically, there are communities that no matter how long they've been present in the territory that is today Kenya, cannot get ID cards or cannot get them easily. So the Nubian um, community, which is Sudanese soldiers who fought on the side of the colonial administration in the independence war, many of them have been here since 1948, um, are not issued with ID cards easily, have to go through a very uh, rigorous vetting procedure. And vetting is a discriminatory practice. Not all people from all ethnic groups are subjected to vetting. It is specific groups that have a history of um, um, opposition from the state. It is Nubians, it is Somalis, ethnic uh, Somalis, it is people who come from border communities because Kenya's borders have always been contested territory. Um, so it creates, the vetting process really formalizes this tiered citizenship. And the ID system has never interrogated that. Um, and with the proposal of digitizing Kenyan ID systems, it is basically about consolidating that and giving the states, as Maya was alluding to, these tremendous powers of surveillance, of controlling freedom of movement, freedom of, um, um, of identity, really of belonging, um, and making it easier for the states to um, lock people out. And this was the basis of the litigation that happened earlier this year, where members of the Nubian community supported by um, rights groups, various rights groups were challenging this formalized ID, this uh, digital ID system because nothing has been done to address the systemic discrimination that has fed into Kenya's ID systems. Um, but you know, it's more complex than that. There's also gender issues embedded in the ID system. There's also questions of not allowing women to hand over to, to succession rights, not allowing women to be able to give ID to their, to their children um, in the ID system, not being able to um, get the 
basically get the ID system because you have to, Kenya is a big country, 57% of our territory is uh, uh, arid and semi-arid areas. And the, all those 57% of the territory is served by one um, of registration place. I think they just opened a second one because there was a big uh, a program about that. But um, there is actual spatial discrimination. People can't physically go and get these ID systems because they have to be subjected to this extra cost. Um, and, and that is because of the embedded logic of discrimination within the state. So that's um, one major political right um, that is affected by digitization, that has been affected by digitization. Another one is LGBTQ rights and women's rights. And the good thing is that the internet has made it easier for minority groups, uh, for, for groups that are not well represented in power. I shouldn't say minority because women are a statistical majority in the country, but they're not well represented within the architecture of power and politics in the country. And so the upside is the digital has made it easier for people who are uh, within these groups to find each other and to organize. Um, right now, the conversation on our constitution has a law that no more than two thirds of the parliament national assembly should not be made up of more than two thirds of one gender. And that has never been implemented. The parliament is incredibly male dominated and the male dominated parliament has refused to operationalize this law. And it is women who have organized online with the hashtag we are 52% who have been pushing and pushing and pushing and saying that this constitution is, that this uh, national assembly is unconstitutional, for advancing that conversation and making room for this criticism for the state. So that's a good thing. Um, the bad thing though is that A, women are, and, and LGBTQ minority groups are being, sexual minorities are being exposed to new forms of violence. We're talking about doxing, we're talking about, um, we don't have swatting here um, just yet, but we do have new forms of violence that are specifically targeting sexual and gender minorities um, and, and new forms of, of um, harm that are being used especially to beat back uh, women, people who have claimed, used the digital to claim more representation. And because of the way in which the society is structured, the law enforcement doesn't recognize these new forms of harm. So things that would obviously be abuse in the analog sense of the word, things that would obviously be libel, would obviously be um, slander in the analog sense are not recognized because they are primarily being used against women in contrast, um, every single law that has been passed to address things like cyber crimes, to address things like hate speech, every single law that has been passed in Kenya in that regard has first and foremost be used to protect the um, protect politicians, to protect people with power. So a great example is the Com Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act, which was passed not this version, but the previous version. And the first instance in which that use, the, the, the law was threatened, um, was, or there was a threat to use the law, was when the governor of Machakos was crossing a bridge and the bridge, he was launching a bridge. He was, oh my gosh, look at me, I'm so great, I built a bridge. And the bridge collapsed and he fell in the water. And the blogger took the picture and tweeted it out. And um, the governor went on Twitter and said, if you don't withdraw this, factual narration of events, I will sue you for harassment under the Cyber Crimes, um, Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act. And that has been the pattern, the misuse of a communications law, uh, uh, misuse of a communications device law, both versions of the Computer Cyber Crimes Law, all, every single law that proposes to address these new forms of digital harm is first and foremost used to punish critics of the state. And these are some of the discriminatory issues that we're struggling to get any kind of um, meaningful conversation on because um, it's hidden. It's like a, um, uh, what do they call them, those uh, Russian dolls? It's hidden, it's, it's, a, it's a Trojan horse that is being used to smuggle in um, controls on freedom of expression, especially in the freedom of the press. Um, but you know, it's not just political rights. Economic rights have also been affected by the digital. And the question of corruption in Kenya is, is a huge problem. I mean, every year for the last 10 years, oh, five years at least, no, sorry, math's not my strong suit, I do words. Every year for the last seven years, up to one third of Kenya's national budget has disappeared. But the Auditor General says, we cannot account to up to one third of the national budget. In a country whereby, um, public schools are struggling, public hospitals are struggling. Right now in the middle of a pandemic, doctors and nurses are on strike because um, money that was uh, supposed to go towards 
PPE has been misappropriated, has disappeared, vast amounts of money. And it's really difficult to overstate the impact of some of these economic crimes on the society, on the most vulnerable, but even the least vulnerable in the society. And um, economic rights are affected in the digital age because of the way in which the state uses the digital to hide their economic crimes and to obscure you know, the patterns of theft and misappropriation of funds. So the example I give in the book is about IFMIS, the um, Independent Financial Management Information System. IFMIS is actually the USAID project program. It was first rolled out in Eastern Europe, um, and then it has been deployed subsequently in various African countries. And the promise of IFMIS is that it makes procurement and accountability in governments more transparent so people can trace every single transaction from the moment it is approved to the moment that the money actually leaves the, um, the treasury. But actually what IFMIS um, has done has made corruption more opaque in Kenya. And in 2016, the Auditor General said, this thing has neither made, it has made it impossible for me to manage, it has made nothing transparent, it has made everything incredibly difficult. Because what's happening is people are sharing passwords, are sharing um, information and approving tra financial transactions at a scale that was impossible to approve um, in the analog era. There have been more economic crimes attached that have happened in Kenya since the advent of IFMIS than in the previous 10 years combined. And so what the digital has done is it's created these black boxes where accountability is difficult, where um, economic crimes can happen without oversight because the people who are supposed to provide oversight no longer have um, the 360 view of the financial transactions that they had with the analog era and, and it, everything is happening faster. So people are not just walking out of treasury with 10,000 shillings, 20,000 shillings, we're talking about in the scale of hundreds of millions um, of dollars disappearing from the budget every year. And these are important economic crimes that are having a significant impact on the country. And, and finally, the last uh, um, right is something that I alluded to before, which is a freedom of expression. And um, just the harms that have come to the public, to the public sphere because of the way in which the state has situated itself in opposition to any kind of critics that, that that criticism that comes from the digital age. So we had a golden period before when the state didn't really understand what was happening on the platforms. And you know, these people are just using Twitter to share pictures of their food and Facebook is about gossip. Data. And there was this golden period where there was a, a significant civil society mobilization on digital platforms that allowed people to hold the state accountable for various actions. Right now we're in the era of pushback. Right now we're in the era of um, all kinds of freedom of expressions being um, um, compromise, as I've mentioned, by the legal and judicial system, but also by intimidation and also by people of power abusing their platforms that they have in order to silence people who have significantly less power than them. Um, you know, one of the questions that we're grappling with, Kenya, and I think you're grappling with this in the United States as well, is should powerful people be able to lie? on social networks? Should they be able to slander citizens and should, should they make libelous claims, defamatory claims against private citizens? You know, if a president goes on Twitter and says, um, this so-and-so blogger um, is a liar and is a criminal uh, based on, you know, this person criticizing them, it has a completely different effect because whether they like it or not, they have significantly more power than that private citizen making individual citizens targets of reprisals by bots. You know, should a minister be able, a cabinet secretary be able to buy influence on social networks and use that to target criticism as the official state censor in Kenya has done for, you know, filmmakers who have made LGBTQ plus uh, content for people who have made music videos that he didn't approve of, you know, paying for bots to tilt the scale of public opinion on social networking platforms. Um, these are things that harms that we're seeing uh, more and more in the country. And we, we have to have kind of a, a much more sophisticated conversation about um, platform governance that allows us to identify these new harms and to, to respond to them um, adequately. Um, I want to stop there because I don't want to take up too much of the time, but I think overall, one of the, the, the questions that the digital is, we, we have to keep coming back to and keep touching base with is, would we be comfortable with the powers 
um, that the digital confers upon the state, would we be comfortable if the state in question was one that we disagreed with? Because I think what's happened in Kenya is what's happened in a lot of developing countries and is happening, and now Europe and, and North America are starting to have this reckoning as well, is that we have believed the lie that the digital can be agnostic. That, you know, Google told us first do no harm, and we just said, yeah, sure, that sounds good. And Facebook says we're going to change the world. Yeah, that sounds great. And we never really stopped to interrogate that these things are not agnostic, that there's a lot of normativity that is built into the tech platforms that is built. And the internet can be a normative good, but the platforms that we use to connect to the internet are loaded with the same considerations of power and, and disparities of power and access that the rest of the society lives with. And so as we assess um, how we're going to think about allocating power and opportunity and access and all of these things and how we're going to use these platforms, we have to come back to the basics, which is, would we be comfortable with this government or this corporation having this much power if we were the people who had the least power in the society? If we disagreed with that government, if you were a critic of the state, if you're a minority group, if you're a person that power does not traditionally see, would you be comfortable allocating that much power to that institution? And I think that's the fundamental question that we have to keep touching base with, even as these innovations come at a much more rapid pace than they have in the previous 20 years, in the previous 50 years, in the previous 100 years. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Nanjula, especially for ending on that really thought-provoking question for us to consider. And we have several questions in the Q&A, so thank you to everyone who's already submitted, and please feel free to um, continue to submit questions. The first question um, to you, Maya, is from um, Andrew, a student in our human rights advocacy class. And the question is, if you could speak a little bit more on the risk that the Chinese government will try to export some of these surveillance and artificial intelligence security systems, including to other authoritarian regimes. And related to that, if that is indeed a risk, what might be some options for preventing the expansion of this artificial intelligence-based surveillance outside of China? Um, well, thank you. And thank you, Andrew, for asking this question. Um, as I was trying to um, kind of sketch out, the use of mass surveillance surrounding the collection of biometrics and other personal data or the use of big data um, programs in Xinjiang and in China are a multi-layered um, effort. Um, the Chinese government spent nearly 20 years to build up this kind of system. And um, what we do see right now, and, and I should also go back to what Nanjala said about the relationship between ID and movement restrictions, is um, in my presentation, I actually didn't um, go into that, is how in Xinjiang, the use of these surveillance system also um, is used for regulating and restricting people's movements. So in, in addition to detaining people in political education camps, giving them long sentences for just having, you know, had the prayer 10 years ago, other people who live in Xinjiang who are not in detention facilities are um, held in house arrest in their own village, in their own city, in a certain block, not allowed to leave the region, not allowed to leave, in, leave China through a series of virtual systems. So the IJOP system that I just discussed um, also connected to the checkpoints throughout the region. So if you are a person who is related to someone who is in prison, um, the, the IJOP system stops you from leaving your hometown because you are considered somewhat problematic. So there's a, a series of virtual gates that regulates people's movements. So you can see that the use of mass surveillance and movement control is not just built through one day um, and it's not just one system. So the, if you look at the export of Chinese surveillance systems through is one belt, one road initiatives or other initiatives, mm -hmm. um, the, um, what I can see so far is what I call off the shelf systems. So you see the sale of facial recognition systems. Um, mostly to other kind of authoritarian countries and governments, um, but not so much kind of this wholesale multi-layered approach. Um, and I think the reason for that is because, well, facial recognition cameras are pretty neat as in a package of system that you can like sell off shelf. Um, but in order to achieve a national ID system, a system where when you take trains, your system is, I'm sorry, the system is actually logging where one person go from one place in the country to another for the whole country of, you know, whatever million people you have, 
Uh, and then building that up to something like IJOP is an incredible amount of bureaucratic centralized effort that quite honestly, countries that are fairly corrupt, <laughs> I, think, I think it's just that the inefficiency prevents that kind of centralized mass surveillance that the Chinese government is able to pull up. So let's, maybe I'm hopeful that these other countries, just because of the way they're built, are different. Um, that, however, I would say um, that these limited off-the-shelf systems already enable these governments, I think, to do more than they did in the past. And at, at the very least, surveillance has an impact on deterrence. So people know when they're being watched, they have to be careful, regardless of whether or not they know actually whether or not they would be getting into trouble, they fear getting into trouble. And then that has an impact on people's um, behavior. Um, and then um, I think the relationship between these governments and um, Chinese expansion of surveillance um, is quite interesting. I, I don't think we should really think about them as a way, I, I think that I see another question about um, American companies and European companies. I, I want, can I answer that one as well? Okay. So um, I, I think implicit in some of the reporting concerning Chinese companies export of surveillance products is the idea that, oh, China has replaced other you know, European and American as this colonial power in the world, and they are doing bad things in, in all of these other countries. Um, I think what is happening now is more kind of um, a new form of, and, and I'm not sure colonialism is the right word for it, um, because it's more, um, it's more kind of like a cartel. <laughs> You've got the Chinese government, which is abusing people's rights in China, and it's kind of supporting and ensuring that other dictators are in the club, that they all help each other, but we provide each other with the technologies. But at the same time, there's a bit of give and take. So the dictators club elsewhere um, are also, you know, using the technologies and negotiating terms um, with regard to these technologies in a way that suit them. So um, it's not kind of like this one size fit all where China say, okay, you have to use the system or else we're going to like punish you. It's more kind of, well, these other governments also have a lot of willingness to do whatever they have been doing to their own citizens. And that find the Chinese supposed to be fairly cheap, um, fairly um, easily accessible. And American and European technologies have also been exported in the past for the use of surveillance and targeted hacking of um, dissidents and activists in, in other countries as well. The difference here between these two kind of forms of ex exports is that A, it's a lot harder to hold Chinese companies accountable because they're based in China. There's, there's no activist organization in China that would help you to actually sue these companies in China. Mm. Um, and is that because these, these Chinese technology companies have honed their surveillance skills on a very big population without any regard to privacy, because there's no law protecting privacy in China, um, they have also developed pretty advanced systems. So if you look at facial recognition companies and how well they do in actually recognizing faces and objects, Chinese companies have come up really quickly because they are fostered by an unlevel playing field. The Chinese government is also you know, encouraging them through funding and subsidies. They are becoming more advanced. So um, actually they are beating, I think, European and American companies at the surveillance game, which would mean that in the future they would have a better chance at capturing the world market. Now there's an other, other dimension to this is that are the Chinese companies capturing data of people from say the African continent, Zimbabwe and so on, and feeding them back to China? Is, is China essentially surveilling the rest of the world? I think that's an open question. Um, is that data colonialism? That's also an open question. Um, um, but I think the um, I think we need a uh, perhaps a different framework of looking at this relationship um, about this kind of new digital. Is it colonialism? Is it some other forms of exchange um, that ultimately is bad for I think all of us <laughs> when it comes to the aggregate amount of freedoms human beings would enjoy as we go forward with more technologies. Um, I, if I may respond as well, um, I wanted to mention that the 
vast majority of the surveillance architecture that's being rolled out in Africa is being built by Chinese companies, specifically Huawei. Um, so for example, in Kenya, we have um, a network of cameras that are um, in all urban areas. Um, so pe police are able to zoom into incredible detail to see people's faces. And the, the, the interesting thing that people have always pointed out about Kenya's uh, camera infrastructure is that it has never caught any sort of armed robber, it's never caught any kind of car robbery, it's never caught anybody, but it will find political dissidents in a matter of hours. And so we've had critics of the state who have woken up and found, you know, the police at their front doorstep and have been like, you know, how did you know where I live? Um, because that information is not in the public domain. And so um, there's definitely a question of exportation of technology. But to just reinforce what Maya was saying, I think a lot of, to date, a lot of the criticism of the Chinese um, exportation of all this technology has not been that the that surveillance is inherently bad. It has been that European countries and North American countries want to be the ones that are building Africa's surveillance architecture. There hasn't been that normative interrogation of, well, should we be building these massive surveillance networks? Because Europe is, uh, you know, London, is, there's a one street in London where you, I think you, there's a, a, like a thousand cameras on you if you stand in one particular corner in Canary Wharf, that there's a thousand cameras pointed at you at any one particular moment. The surveillance architecture in um, London is incredibly elaborate. And so the, 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 the underlying normative questions, it, many of these European companies are not asking, um, and, and are trying to touch them. They just want to be able to have the the same level of access to this information that um, other countries are having. But, and again, it's, it's not just China and Europe. You know, last year, the Financial Times published an expose about the NSO Group, which is an Israeli company that has been selling um, African governments, especially authoritarian governments, the capacity to hack into WhatsApp, which is supposed to be end-to-end -end encrypted. And several Rwandese um, critics of the Rwandan states have reported that they were, they didn't understand how the government was able to find them. One person got on a plane in Australia, and I think he was going to South Africa, and the Rwandese um, security agencies met him at the boarding gate for his connecting flight. And he hadn't discussed his plan publicly. He hadn't emailed anybody about it. All of the planning and the conversation had happened on WhatsApp. And, you know, the report was connecting the NSO, NSO group um, to um, this particular um, uh, technology and to its, its use in Rwanda, um, its use, and I think, in Zimbabwe as well. And, you know, the meta question, again, uh, you know, with the political rights are, are bad, it's bad enough or it's important enough to have the conversation about the specific um, political rights and the surveillance and digital rights. But then the meta question is also the economic rights. What does it mean for a poor government to spend, to be encouraged to spend on expensive tech that pr benefits private corporations in China, in Israel, in, L in the UK, in the US, at the expense of making food, water, healthcare, you know, clean water available to its own citizens. And this is a Zimbabwe case, for example, where doctors and nurses are earning, you know, $300, $400 a month working through a pandemic with minimal um, um, uh, PPE with minimal facilities. And yet the Zimbabwean government has been one of the biggest customers of Chinese surveillance um, facial recognition software because of the, the silence that Maya was pointing out, which is that most surveillance, most facial recognition software struggles to uh, um, identify black faces to deal with black faces because the tech is being built in countries where black people are a minority. It's not being trained on black um, data. And that's where the African countries sort of come into the, to the calculation. Um, well, what does it mean for the Zimbabwean government to spend, to give money um, to a Chinese a company to do that when it can't even provide you know, basic services for its own doctors, its teachers, its nurses. That's an economic, those are questions of economic rights that are also, um, that are equally important to look into. Great, thank you. And thanks also for answering that second question from Dean Kobolev on the role of private tech companies in facilitating surveillance. We have another question that you've touched on briefly, both of you, but looking at the ways in which the relationship between mass surveillance and the current pandemic um, and so if you could each share a little bit um, on the ways in which mass surveillance, especially as it's been used um, for testing purposes, for example, impacting different rights and including not knowing the ways in which this data might be used going forward. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that in the context of both China and Kenya and sort of the flip side of that, there's another question about the extent to which there is a right to internet. And again, given the pandemic, this is something that's come to the forefront 
as people who don't have access to internet, for example, are not able to attend remote classes and so impacting their right to education or employment. So sort of both, both sides of the coin in terms of the impact of COVID, both for mass surveillance and also for advocacy around a right to the internet. Um, um, go ahead, Mayor. Oh, I just thought Najella looks like she's writing. Um, I, I'll go first. Um, so in China, um, maybe you have all seen the reporting about the Chinese government's use well, of what is called the Health Code app. Um, and it's developed by two private companies, um, Tencent and Alibaba. And the way it works is that these companies, um, uh, get, uh, this, this app gives people a, a tricolor code, um, red, yellow, and green. Uh, depending on the color of the code, you red is 14 days of quarantine, green is you can go to different places. Um, and the way the app, the color is given to you is um, determined by a black box algorithm, um, uh, which is um, determined in part by location. So your GPS location, but also your relationships, whether or not you're related to or have been to uh, in contact with somebody who is suspected of having COVID. Um, the, the problem with some uh, approach like that is uh, multifold. One of them is that um, the health code appears to be in part tapping into the state surveillance infrastructure. Um, I mean, first of all, the, 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 um, you use that app because you have to get around, because the, the, the government officials and private companies on many levels, even just going to the supermarket, requires you to show them an app and the color. And you can't really live without um, being giving access to these two companies in terms of your location. So to what extent there is meaningful consent to that app is basically there's none because you have to access your life necessities. Um, and then the second problem is that um, it uh, is fairly arbitrary. Um, you can complain about, so people have complained about how, well, I've never even been to a place where there's COVID. I've never been in touch with someone with COVID and yet I have this red code or the red code doesn't disappear after 14 days, I'm still red after the whole month. Um, and you can get a hotline, you can call a hotline to help, um, but um, the hotline itself is mechanical. So um, diff there's difficulty accessing an actual human being to, to seek redress about the code, which um, has impact on your um, movements. Um, and then finally, I think the code really um, already uh, kind of entrenches this acceptance of technological solutions that are actually fairly intrusive on people's lives when there are alternatives to tracking and managing COVID. In other Asian countries, for example, uh, in Taiwan, for example, we have also documented good practices there where, um, you know, people's participation and trust in government is accomplished through transparency, a respect for human rights, and um, in Taiwan, they have also managed to um, address COVID without uh, adopting uh, draconian measures like in China, not only using health code app, but also using um, quarantine that essentially involves barricading people in their homes um, with iron steel rods and, and punishing people who venture out. So um, I think that there are some, um, I, I think the whole COVID crisis and the world has also led to um, an entrenchment and the settings of surveillance methods that we wouldn't ordinarily um, use otherwise. Um, I think that, so the, the thing that's been really interesting about uh, the use of surveillance tech in Africa with relation to COVID is that there is just no political will. People, the governments just don't want to do anything about this pandemic because there is almost like a, a sense of denialism that if we just pretend that it's not going to be a thing, then it's not going to be a thing. And so we were anticipating that there would be this massive encroachment of digital rights, that there would be this massive surveillance architecture. But for example, in Kenya, um, we everything is still being done paper and pen. You still just you know write in your ID card details, your phone number and whatever. And of course, um, a lot of people are just not giving the correct information because there's an, a, a mistrust is an entrenched mistrust of how the state misuses identity information there's a fear of stigmatization um, because the very first wave of covid infections in kenya was met with a criminalization of the public health response so there was arrests there was arbitrary arrests and detentions there was very violent um, um you know 15 people were killed within the first two weeks of the first case 
um, in Kenya and the first two weeks of lockdown in Kenya. And so that criminalization has fueled a lot of covert resistance to any measures to um, identify uh, COVID patients. Very, very few pub uh, and, and public figures who've had COVID have said, you know, I've had it. But ordinary people are, are very reluctant to, to acknowledge that because of that stigma. And so what I, what I suspect, what I intuit that is happening is that the government is waiting for someone else to build a platform for them for free that they're not going to actually invest any kind of money into building any kind of, of architecture, partly because the government's broke. Um, there's no money um, and, 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 you know, the tourism is one of our biggest um, income generators and the cabinet secretary announced last week that the tourism sector has contracted by up to 91%. So we're expecting, we're, we're gearing up for a recession, we're gearing up for an economic, a massive economic contraction and, and the idea of there's, it's, there's no money to spend on building a surveillance architecture. Rather, what there is is this process of um, sort of torturing the, the curve into submission so that we can say, well, you know, we have to open and everybody has, just has to deal with, with the disease on an uh, individual basis. Um, there is a COVID and tech commission that was put together by the coming secretary. I think they've met a couple of times, but as of now, there is no, there's nothing um, except, you know, the analog sort of reporting. Um, I want to answer the question about the right to internet because I think this is one of the most important sleights of hand that has happened in the last um, 15 years, 20 years with the internet. We have to be very firm about the difference, the distinction between a right of the to the internet and the economic benefits of the platforms that allow us to connect to the internet. So protecting the right to the internet doesn't mean allowing, for example, Facebook free reign to profit off of the Ethiopian public. So this is the free basics platform, which was rolled out in many developing countries um, in very quietly to very little fanfare. And what free basics is, is a, a version of the internet that is curated by Facebook, that is curated by people who, you know, Facebook didn't have an Africa office until 2015. It was a sales office. They started having policy people who were actually trying to understand um, internet public policy in Africa last year. That's when they first started to hire people who actually understood the politics of the various countries that they're operating in. Meanwhile, um, the level of, of hate speech. So I'll just give the example of Ethiopia. Ethiopia has had a very contentious um, election period over the last 20, 15 years. Hate speech, in, uh, especially in languages other than English, is incredibly high um, because there is uh, there, the pressure of living under an authoritarian regime when it comes off. There's always this period of adjustment. There's always this period of people sort of testing the boundaries of what they can, cannot say, should, should not say. And the law struggles to articulate that, to deal with that. Um, and the public struggles to deal with that. So what's happened in Ethiopia is that a lot of people, because of the contraction in the uh, media space, the internet and Facebook especially has become a primary way through political discourse is conducted. And so we had a case, for example, where a post went up on one of these Facebook-based media outlets, and within 48 hours, 68 people were dead because of the inflammatory nature of that um, particular post. Now, Facebook didn't have content moderation in Amharic, which is the official language of Ethiopia, the second largest uh, population in sub-Saharan Africa, 110 million people, did not have content moderation in Amharic until January of 2019. And Amharic is just the official language. We're not even talking about any of the other 50, 60 languages that are spoken in Ethiopia. Afan or Roma has the biggest, the largest ethnic group in um, some in um, Ethiopia is Oromo. There's no content moderation in, in, in Afan or Romo. Um, we have the same problem in Kenya. There are training content moderation in East Africa with Kenyans who speak a different dialect of Kiswahili than people in the DRC, than people in Uganda, than people in Tanzania. And so there's that quality gap that doesn't allow any kind of effective oversight on um, the content that's being produced, a lot of it which is inflammatory. And some of it which is, and a lot of it which is good, a lot of it which is criticizing the state, a lot of it which is you know, defending rights, a lot of which is saying things that you're not allowed to say in the analog public sphere. And there is not understanding, there's not a complex understanding of how to balance all of these interests because the overriding motive, intention of Facebook is not the public interest. It is the 
financial interests of its shareholders, its owners, the people who make money off of the model. And so everything that's happening in terms of moderating, in terms of balancing out all of these concerns and interests is always um, uh, framed around or contained by this overarching financial interest of profits, endless profit making. And so that's why I keep insisting that we have to be very deliberate and intentional about making a distinction between the right to the internet and the right of platforms that allow us the ramps that get us onto the internet to continue to make money indefinitely off of this. Companies should not be allowed to piggyback things that are profiting, they're profiting off, off of this particular, this broader interest. So Google launching balloons in Kenya during COVID to say, well, we're launching these balloons in order to allow us Kenyans to have the right to access the internet. Meanwhile, the internet that Kenyans are being allowed to access is a curated version of the internet that is curated in order to advance the interests of the advertisers who pay to be on, on Google, which in, in by extension is allowing Google to make money off of this right. Those are some of the very nuanced discussions, philosophical rights-based discussions that we need to be having and we need to be in the room to advance because what's happened in Africa, what's happened in Asia, what's happened in Latin America with this muddying of that distinction is that our rights are being subsumed under a broader conversation about profit making and governments are in bed with the private corporations to the detriment of the citizen. And the citizen, and I use that language very deliberately, the citizen, not the user, not the consumer, not anything that is framed in this very narrow capitalist sense, the citizen who has rights vis-a-vis -vis their particular government. Thank you both. And just a quick note, um, we're supposed to finish at 1.30, but given that we got started a bit late, I'm gonna take us to 1.35 so that we can also get in one last question from our audience, which is uh, mainly directed at Maya, but I'm gonna broaden the question also. What kind of advocacy is needed right now in responding to abuses in Xinjiang, given that even calls from the UN to carry out independent assessments have not happened? And I'd like to broaden that also um, to encompass and to in bring Nanjil in as well, that you've both spoken about different methods of advocacy with respect to digital rights, whether litigation or documenting good practices and looking at the ways in which digital rights are connected to political and economic rights. So if you could say just a few words about for law students and lawyers, some of the different ways to become involved in advocacy or activism around digital rights. Um, well, thank you. Um, I think that um, Xinjiang, well, first of all, we need to have the perspective. This is one of the most powerful governments with long standing abuses. It's not going to happen tomorrow. We're going to think, well, it's going to probably take decades for any form of accountability, if at all, if our human rights mechanisms still exist in decades' time, given the way we are in the world today. If there is still that um, mechanism, we, so that's why accurate documentation is so incredibly important. And that's what Human Rights Watch also does. Um, the second thing is that we need to have a re-engagement with human rights institutions, which for some of the US government has you know, somewhat abandoned, uh, especially in the current administration. A re-engagement of human rights institutions would go a long way in holding even the worst abusers accountable. We also need to have cooperation of civil society across the world. For example, what the Chinese, government, Chinese companies are doing or not doing in various parts of the world. We actually know very little about that because actually civil society across different countries don't work very well together because of limited um, ability. But also these are cross-national matters that often don't you know, see civil society cooperate very well. Um, we also need to, um, so for example, on the issue of Xinjiang, um, uh, we still have not seen Muslim majority governments speak up. Um, we are depending on Muslim majority civil society organizations in those countries to really help us to, to push their governments to speak up on this issue and really hold them accountable when they soft, you know, um, are soft on it. Um, and then I think that a broader um, answer is the development of technologies. And, and Angela said earlier how these technologies are not agnostic. And they have proven not to be. Um, for example, in the development of 5G, which we see, you know, Chinese companies 
Huawei is dominating. But not only, you know, Cisco and then other companies are, um, sorry, not, not Cisco, uh, but other um, uh, American and European companies like Ericsson and so on, are also uh, at the game. And none of them, as far as I can tell, are really pushing human rights at the center of technological, of these 5G de de developments. And the reason is because um, technological and technical standard settings are generally very insulated from um, civil co um, citizens' concerns. Um, and it is time, it's because these are difficult conversations, they're, they're somewhat technical, um, and they are extremely insulated from public pressure. Um, and to the extent we can build a movement to a popular one to, to push for that and to say, well, you know, actually developments of 5G and development of social media and regulation of data rights are not so different from, say, making sure that our city are, are livable, there shouldn't be as much pollution. If, if the conversation is to that extent where we're not allowing companies to just drive those conversations, but citizens drive at them because they are our basic rights, I think that would change um, the conversation. Um, and I think the use of developing international standards around surveillance, around data collection, would be incredibly important in um, stigmatizing these very, very bad practices that are happening in China. Because right now, we only have, well, China is doing kind of similar thing as the US, right? That's often what we are told. But in fact, it is not. We have to really stigmatize the worst behavior. Thank you. Hmm. Um, I guess the only thing I will add is that it's really important that we get better at listening across difference. And I, you know, when I said at the top of my presentation that focusing on Kenya was not just because I was Kenyan, it's because this was a really uh, advanced warning of what was coming down the pipeline. So people in the U.S. started to freak out about Cambridge Analytica in 2016. Well, Cambridge Analytica has been operating in Kenya since 2011 and really testing and, and refining some of these things that are happening in U.S. elections um, on countries where the law is a lot less stringent and where there's a lot less um, uh, connection between advocacy rights and, and power. So the, the government can just sort of ignore and overlook what um, advocates uh, are saying. And so it's really important for people who are operating in social political contexts where the government is more responsive to criticisms that come from civil society, that come from uh, rights activists, to learn how to listen to people who are on the other side of the world on whom some of these practices are being refined before being rolled out to countries where the law is somewhat more um, stringent and somewhat more um, um, effective, really, as a tool for, for social um, uh, change. And, and embedded in that is the idea that we cannot um, uh, co-opt some of these conversations. So, you know, everybody's talking about this uh, movie, The Social Dilemma, and, and uh, one of the things that you'll notice in, in that video is that the complete absence of women of color and, and, and women in general from that conversation. And it's really frustrating, especially as a woman who has been active in these conversations for at least 10, 12 years. Um, and, I, and I'm not even the most visible person. You know, Zainab Tufekki has been working on social networking and advocacy for many years. Safiya Noble has been talking about algorithms and, of exclusion. There's a tremendous cadre of female uh, researchers in India who have been at the forefront of the uh, digital ID, digital rights um, conversation. And, and this, we have to stop assuming, make, transferring the same assumptions about who can know and who can have something to say that are embedded in the dominant structure. We have to stop replicating that within the advocacy framework. There are people who have been raising the red flag about all of these issues who might not look um, the way in which we are accustomed to thinking people who know about tech look, who might not fit the Silicon Valley mold of uh, understanding what an algorithm is and the impact that it has, but actually have very important things to say. Um, the most powerful analytical tool that I, I had in my book was using a feminist methodology to think about tech and politics. And the feminist methodology basically begins with a question, who do you assume is a central referent object in your analysis? 
And what does your analysis look like? You know, those of you who are studying law, who have studied the criminal law, know that the standard of the reasonable man um, assumes certain things about who that person is. Well, what does the platform look like when the reasonable man is a woman of color who doesn't necessarily have money, is an Indian woman working in, um, you know, a small uh, or a medium-sized city and not, not New Delhi and not Mumbai? What changes about our analysis when we don't make assumptions about the person who's at the center of analysis? And and building off of that, what are the, what are the cross-cutting issues that we can see that we can apply, whether we're talking about digital rights with respect to privacy, with respect to surveillance, with respect to access, with respect to all of these connected issues, to start to think about how all of these things are connected and to get better at listening um, across difference. I think those are the two things that I would say um, are really desperately needed right now because people have been raising the flag uh, raising the red flag um, in many countries, you know, I'm talking about Kenya, um, learn how to listen across difference and see what people are saying in India, or saying in Brazil, or saying in South Africa, or saying in Zimbabwe, or saying in Romania and Bulgaria, because we've been raising these issues for a good decade, uh, maybe even more. Well, thank you so much. A huge thanks again to you, Nanjala Nyabola, and Maya Wang again for your incredible expertise and insights. and also for some concrete framing and advocacy ideas to take us forward, not just with this issue, but with other human rights issues that we're working on as well. So thank you to both of you and for all of you for joining us and for your great questions. Um, just a quick announcement, our next Human Rights in Practice event is October 13th, looking at healthcare in prisons, um, with two speakers, one of whom is a public defense lawyer from Brazil who will share um, litigation that he's working on there with respect to this issue. So thank you again to everybody. Thank you.